Biological Systems Engineering uh, under my advisor, uh, Zach Easton, who some of you may have heard speak about soil water earlier in the week. Um, and today I'll be discussing uh, drainage basics and drainage, a little bit about drainage water management. So just to outline what we'll be discussing today, uh, why now, why are we interested in agricultural drainage in our region? What are the benefits of drainage? And a little bit of the basics at Drainage 101. The nuts and bolts of system design we'll look at a little bit. Um, briefly touch on regulations as well as mitigating some of the environmental issues associated with drainage. So why is, is drainage needed? Obviously um, when you have uh, saturated areas in your land, uh, your crop yields can suffer when you have poor drainage, you can poor seed development, low germination rates uh, leading to these bare spots pictured. Um, you can have standing water uh, problems with accessing your field as well that can occur in sensitive times such as planting and harvest. Additionally, we're looking at uh, changing precipitation trends in, in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, specifically, we're looking at um, an increase in the annual precipitation in many of the areas that will occur in the non-growing season, which can be problematic um, as there's lower evapotranspiration rates during that time with the water, and we can have drier summers, um, as a little bit there um, on, on the eastern shore and uh, Del Marva regions. So in addition to the changes in the quantity and timing of precipitation, we're also looking at increased likelihood of more extreme events. We can have um, increased periods of drought um, and heavier rainfall intensities. And those heavier intensities of rainfall um, can, can drive the need for drainage in this region as well. So this is a map showing um, of the areas that could most benefit from drainage. Um, driven mostly by the, the properties of the soil and the drainage characteristics, but we have to ask how this is going to change in the, in the coming years. Um, and what's important to note here is although we consider um, the Corn Belt the areas that are most um, intensely drained in the United, drained in the United States, um, we can see significant areas of the Atlantic that are forecasted to benefit from drainage. Oops. <laughs> um, so, uh, as far as some of the benefits of drainage, um, you can get increased yields and productivity from your land, um, and importantly, more consistent yields. So you don't have to worry about variability uh, year to year as driven by the precipitation. This graphic here um, shows some data from the uh, Canada Ministry of Agriculture, uh, which is just meant to demonstrate that the yield increases um, can occur when drainage is indicated across a, a variety of crops. Obviously, these increases will be very area size specific, um, regionally specific, um, so this is not to reflect the actual increases you can expect, but more to indicate the variety of crops that can benefit, and to point out that, um, for example, corn yield increases in response to drainage are, are much greater than soy yield increases generally. Also, better access and timeliness of planting and harvest is very important. You don't want to go out and get stuck with these guys. Um, and that is important in our area when we have these really wet winters and springs that can uh, delay access uh, to the field, which would be especially important as your um, growing season shortens in northern latitudes. Additionally, uh, when traffic occurs on a wet field, the higher the soil moisture content, the more compaction you're gonna get and the deeper that compaction is gonna go, which will be um, that deep, difficult to remedy compaction, uh, which is something we want to avoid. Also, um, a benefit that is not uh, typically highlighted is actually the, the channeling of the agricultural drainage flow. So this represents an opportunity to control and treat these discharges. Whereas some people um, you know, discuss, will discuss the environmental impacts um, that, that can be detrimental. It's actually uh, also an opportunity to control these impacts, which is a positive. So at, at Drainage 101, uh, the process, uh, uh, processes can be broadly divided into drainage of surface water, water that's affecting um, above the ground surface, and subsurface drainage, that saturation of the root zone that can be problematic. Surface drainage can involve ditching or land leveling and smoothing, uh, whereas subsurface drainage can be passive drainage systems um, with submerged drains, or they can actually be water table control systems where you can more finely tune um, the level of the water table in your fields. 
the goal of all of these systems is to have water removed within 24 or 48 hours of a heavy rain event. So that points back to the quantity of rain. It depends on how heavy rain event you're expecting and are gonna, is going to occur frequently is how you're going to design your system to handle that. So obviously there are different approaches uh, depending on your soil conditions and actual problems you're experiencing. When you have low infiltration rates, such as high clay soils or compacted soils, you're going to get um, ponding on the surface and surface depressions. And that could, a potential solution would be smoothing the surface uh, to prevent those irregularities. If your soil is completely saturated, if you have saturation in the root zone and poorly drained soil, you'll want to consider either a tile or ditching. We'll discuss a little bit um, when those different approaches are indicated. Or if you have shallow and peating soil layers, um, you're going to get saturation in the root zone and ponding on the surface. So you might consider a ditch system or a tile system with surface inlets to more quickly remove that water from the surface. So first we'll talk about surface drainage a little bit. That is for water originating on site in those, in those surface depressions. Like we said, the fine textured, low permeability soils uh, can be a problem with respect to surface drainage. Um, and these surface depressions can be eradicated with land leveling, um, as you can see, pictured on the left, and uh, ditching systems as well. So surface smoothing and leveling um, provides better drainage and additionally when used in conjunction with a uh, ditch system can actually reduce uh, the number of surface ditches required to drain your area. Uh, it can allow for more equipment operation. If you can get away with just smoothing your surface then you don't have any ditches to contend with um, navigating it in the field um, and preventing the, the movement of your equipment. Uh, so obviously our topsoil is very valuable so there are limits to how much smoothing can be done depending on how much soil would need to be removed in order to achieve this. Equipment you can use, uh, rough grading can be accomplished with the graders, um, with tractors and scrapers for rough grading. Um, a land plane or a leveler can get much higher precision down to about an uh, inch and a half. Um, and then there's also precision landforming um, with a laser level as pictured on the top um, where you can actually design your grade for your field and implement that. So really important when designing our surface ditch system is deciding what the capacity of the system needs to be in order to handle the drainage and get that water removed from the field in a timely manner. So there's a wonderful resource, the um, NRCS uh, Engineering Field Handbook that has this drainage guide, and that's where this equation and, and a couple others that will follow don't write down for two main equations I need. Um, the flow, uh, can simply be calculated using the, the area of your field and the drainage curve number depending on your location and your crops. Most of us are located here in, in the northern humid region um, and we have these different drainage curve numbers for pasture and uh, cultivated crops. In the southeastern region, except for the eastern shore of Virginia, which actually um, uses the northern numbers, um, we have a finer division of, of the different um, types of crops that we might um, use for this calculation. Then we need to determine the layout of our system, the orientation, the pattern, and the, and the spacing. So this is gonna deal with um, where's the source of your water? Is it on-site? Is it accumulating in those depressions? Or is it off-site? Is it flowing in from higher upslope areas? What's the topography? Is it uniform or irregular? Do you need to do that land smoothing um, by itself or in conjunction with the ditches? Is the land flat or sloped? Uh, what's the permeability of the soil? And what are your field operations that might be interrupted by installing ditches? Uh, pictured here is an example of a random uh, layout of uh, ditches connecting the surface depressions and then feeding it to a main drain. Uh, in contrast, this is a cross slope design where we have the ditches um, perpendicular to the direction of the slope to intercept that water that might be entering from upslope of the field area. You also need to consider your gradient, the shape of your ditch, and the, and the side slope. So the soil type dictates, dictates a lot of these decisions. Um, you want to, there's a range of ideal velocities um, associated with soil type recommended in the drainage guide to avoid sedimentation, 
um, your water going too slow and then allowing the sediment to fall out of the solution and fill in the volume of your dish so you can actually transport less water than you calculated that you could. Um, as well as water moving too fast with too much energy that can scour and lead to problems with erosion and export of sediments. The soil type also dictates the steepest slide slope you can use before you get failure and those banks slumping off. Although generally much duller slopes will be used um, in order to facilitate maintenance like bank mowing. Um, the ditch bottom grade determines the velocity of the flow for a, a given sheet. Um, there are equations for this in the, in the drainage guide. Um, and this grade is, is limited also by existing structures, such as, as bridges or culverts going under roads. So the capacity of the ditch is equal to that velocity times the cross-sectional area. And obviously the ditch shape uh, that you choose will play a function in how you can adjust this velocity and the flow capacity of the system. Transitioning into discussing subsurface drainage, uh, these systems are typically referred to as, as tile drains. Uh, pictured in the, the top right, we have the um, old-fashioned terracotta clay tile. Um, today, they're, they're more often made of perforated plastics, although there are a lot of different materials you can choose from. So the tile, the purpose of the tile drain is to, as opposed to the surface system, to remove that surface water, um, the potted water, is to remove water that's saturated in the root zone. But this doesn't remove plant available water because there is a capillary fringe that um, allows the roots to access the water that's above the area that is saturated. And how large that capillary fringe is and that area that will occur here depends on your soil texture, your soil type. Um, so that's something that also needs to be considered. So subsurface drainage will reduce problems with water stress to your crop um, under saturated conditions. The roots uh, cannot access a sufficient amount of oxygen, and it produces problems um, with the negative effects on the aerobic microorganisms, which facilitate <coughs> trade availability to the crop. As you can see with this figure, if you have uncontrolled drainage and you get this high water table in the early part of the season in the spring, it can lead to the development of, of shallow root systems. And then when the water table drops subsequently in the summer, um, your roots won't have sufficiently developed to actually access that capillary fringe of water. Um, but where you implement the uh, subsurface drain, you'll get better root development and then we'll be able to act, the crop will be able to access the water table throughout the growing season. So when you have these healthier plants with better root stock, with better um, development, you'll have less susceptibility to disease, you'll have consistent yields, and you'll also um, benefit from reducing your runoff and erosion because more of that water will be transmitted through the subsurface system than over the land. So the big design factor in, in the tile drainage system is, uh, is deciding on your depth and spacing requirements. If you have correctly spaced drains, all, all you get a uniform crop growth across the field and all of these plants can access the water. If, for example, your drains are too far, too spaced too far apart, you can actually still get saturation in the root zone um, at the midpoint between the drains and that, that can cause problems. Alternatively, if your drains are too close together when you don't need that, you're just wasting money putting in extra drainage. So the, the spacing and depth of these drains is largely driven by the soil permeability, um, how quickly that water can actually get to that drain. Um, you know, so you need to adjust the distance accordingly. The soil depth, the type of crop, how deep is your root zone. Um, stratification, are there any restricting layers, clay pans that might affect the placement of your drain? Um, as well as the climate, as we were talking about, like how much water are you expecting? How big are your big rains that you're designing for? Uh, as well as the grade and topography. Normally, tile drainage is uh, limited to the flatter slopes because um, it's preclusively expensive to put the number of drainage control structures in that would be required to keep the water table um, close enough to the surface at, at the upslope areas um, as opposed to all draining down um, to the low, lower slope of the field. 
So here's an equation um, for step and spacing that I only show to highlight what the variables are in determining this. Um, the hydrologic conductivity of the soil, that permeability of the soil is very important. Um, your drainage coefficient, which I'll show you in a table in the following slide. Um, the distance between the drain and the barrier, the impermeable um, layer below the drain. And there's also some assumptions you can make in the drainage guide if it's, it's farther than, um, I believe, twice the distance of the drain to the surface. And also, a important design variable will be that drawdown distance from the midpoint and the curve. Um, like we showed on the previous slide, you know, getting that water level um, sufficiently low enough to not negatively impact the drainage of the crops growing in that section. So the depth will largely be driven by that, that soil type, that capillary rise that allows the different crops to um, access the water above the saturated water table. And obviously that's driven by your specific crop and its root zone. You also need to consider the tillage, the equipment you'll be using, and uh, the frost penetration because you'll want your, your tile system low enough to be protected from all of those. You look at layer permeability, are there any abrupt changes in uh, permeability in the soil that could affect your system? And the outlet location. Um, do you have sufficient um, slope and outlet so you can actually remove all of that water efficiently once it's exported from the tile system? This is just a simple table of the drainage coefficients that you use in, in that uh, previous equation based on uh, crop type and soil type. There are some slight modifications for um, moving one direction or another within those ranges of values for soil, soil permeability and crops, um, and surface inlets are important uh, because that will add a lot to the volume of water in your system if you have a direct conduit between the surface and the subsurface. So you need to estimate your soil hydrologic conductivity for this table. Obviously, it's best if you can have um, a soil sample um, have the test done in your in field, um, actually have an analysis, but there are um, examples of how to estimate this in, in the drainage guide. Although you can see that there's fairly large ranges between the estimated values for the different um, soil types. So another thing you can do is go on the USDA web soil survey and see if you can find any more specific information about your soils present. As far as drain sizing, that's going to be driven by the volume of your system. Um, there's a simple equation here just based on the area, that drainage coefficient in the table, um, and just divided by a constant to determine the cubic feet per second from flowing through your system. Then you can go to the NRCS drainage guide, and depending on your pipe material and the grade you select, you can see what the diameter is that's required um, to accommodate these flows. The material matters because that roughness is going to be different that actually slows the water down as it moves through the pipe. And then grade is um, more difficult to advise. It's very site specific, but it is constrained by the design depth, how deep you want it relative to the surface, what the slope is of the land, and that outlet is really important. Um, you know, you need a free falling area for that water to be removed, or you need to consider pumping we'll talk about in a minute. For, as far as layout and orientation, it's desirable for the, the laterals feeding the main to be in the same direction as the slope. We have different lateral configurations here with parallel, herringbone, a double main, and then just a, a random layout. So although the configuration is different, they're all um, laterals feeding a main. And in practice, it, it usually turns out that you more have random pattern areas. You, you might use different patterns and different Some additional components um, that are typically involved in subsurface drainage include surface inlets for these ponded areas, drain envelopes, um, which can be as simple as the um, tile stock here, or they can be something like this bridge drain where you use coarser, high permeability material around the subsurface drain to increase the speed at which the water can get to the drain and remove from the field. So by using these drain envelopes, you can actually reduce the depth and spacing of your tile system, which is beneficial because that can save on the cost of implementing the system. And then there's a recommendation for what type of drain envelope to use in the NRCS drainage guide, depending on your soil type, the texture of your soil. 
there are also junction boxes when you have multiple laterals meeting uh, together and vents and relief wells, which are specifically when multiple um, conduits meet that I have uh, slope changes or abrupt elevation changes, and those allow um, release of the vacuum that's created. You also need outlet protection to keep varmints and such out of your tunnels. Some of the limitations of tile drainage uh, are the lack of an outlet. That's a big one. Um, if, if it's economically viable, you can pump the water. If there's not a sufficient drop in elevation at which you can expel that water from the system. But that's also another major cost. So that's something that's very site specific. Um, lack of, of slope. So you don't have enough slope in, in your field to get to that, that outlet. Um, very low permeability soils. It just, even with the presence of a drain, once it's that deep to be out of the way of your um, tillage processes and, and such and provide sufficient drainage, it's, it, the water just won't reach it in time to be effective. And that's when a ditch system is indicated. The rest of it would be constructed obstructions, um, subsidence and sandy soils is something that needs to be considered with these systems. And what's really, um, site specific and complex is, is the economic return. You're going to have to estimate um, your benefits in crop yield and field access um, and basically this is usually done in consultation with a drainage contractor, drainage technician, um, and considering multiple different scenarios and solutions. Just to touch on uh, a couple of the regulatory issues, um, Basically, the purpose of this slide is just be in touch with the USDA before um, draining any or clearing any wet areas. Um, there are regulations through the Clean Water Act relating to the um, discharge of drenched or fill materials into uh, waters of the US, into wetlands that may be created when you're um, building these systems, um, as well as the withholding of benefits for um, growing agriculture commodities on a uh, wetland converted after 1985 or converting a wetland after 1990. However, these land use conversion issues are mostly historical. In the 50s, since the 50s, we've had a dramatic decrease in response to this legislation um, and other causes of wetland loss due to agriculture. Um, in fact, in the period from 1982 to 1990, almost 60% of, um, of wetland loss was due to development, and I would be positive that that number is only increasing. But some of the contemporary issues that we still need to be concerned about with drainage is the effect on base flow and the residence time of the water in the field. Um, these graphics come from a study looking at the effect of the intensity of your tile system. We have your, as your drainage density, your tile density, basically your spacing decreases, you get a much larger contribution to the base flow downstream. And at the same time, you get an exponential decrease in the amount of time the water spends in the soil. And that's important because the longer the water has to interact with the soil, the more opportunity there are for it to be naturally filtered for the nutrients to be utilized or bind to the soil. The relationship is, is similar but linear as opposed to exponential with the um, increased tile depth. You'll get an increase in base flow with increased depth and a decrease in residence time, increased tile depth. There are also um, impacts on water quality in, in, in addition to water quantity um, with drainage systems. There's, there can be sediment losses. As we said, subsurface drainage is a good opportunity to actually reduce your sediment losses, but a poorly designed system can lead to increased erosion. Nitrogen losses is really the big one because that decreased time spent in the field is and the lowering of the water table um, prevents the natural microbial processes from occurring that remove the nitrogen from the system. And these figures show that the concentration of tile drainage present in the corn belt coincides with the concentration of the highest levels of nitrogen export in the country. And typically we think of phosphorus as being transported with erosion and sediment bound, but now there's growing evidence to su suggest that phosphorus can be an issue in, in drainage waters due to macropore flow. 
This is a dye test showing the water um, moving through large pores in the soil. And essentially, that's the same problem as bypassing that soil, bypassing the interactions there. And you still can um, increase your export of dissolved phosphorus relative to an undrained system. However, there are a lot of good opportunities to mitigate these consequences. Many of them, and Ditches Melissa discussed this morning, um, reduce dip out frequency, um, two-stage ditch design, flow control structures, and actually react barriers in ditches um, to remove nutrients. Tile systems, the big one is water table control, uh, which we'll discuss in a minute. And there's also biofilters and wetlands for nutrient removal. So reduced uh, dip out frequency or partial clean out um, allows for those surfaces to remain intact that, and those communities of microorganisms to remain intact that are responsible for removing the nutrients. So nutrient removal is increased by contact with, with the surfaces through chemical, biological, and physical processes. Um, additionally, um, we can reduce our sediment export by leaving that vegetation in place to stabilize the banks. Ditch mowing is a good uh, alternative to managing the ditches, although that's not going to help with your sedimentation problems. Um, but it does increase bank stability um, and increases the infiltration rate of water in the ditch, which will, like, again, reduce your, your flows in the ditches, which drive the, the sediment export. Two-stage channel construction it, it accommodates both base flows in the lower part of the ditch and peak flows as it is connected to the wider area. You can't see it very well, but this is a shallow channel and then it, at high stages, the water level would be approximately here. So tiles are also placed in the bench of these two-stage ditches, so when the water um, is released, it, it falls on vegetated soil that's protected from erosion. Additionally, you can allow some dish meander to reduce the energy of flow, which is also going to reduce the scour. Then you can invest a little bit more with flow control structures to reduce the energy of the flow. Um, it reduces erosion, increases aeration of the system. Or you can go as uh, more complex with actual stage control in the ditches to retain water in the non-growing season. Um, or extended dry spells during the growing season. Increasing that residence time of the water in the field, utilizing those natural filtration capacities, um, and thought to potentially increase absorption of phosphorus and denitrification, which is pretty much analogous to the water table control efforts with um, tile drainage. There are also re reactive barriers that capture the diffuse flow that run uh, parallel to the ditches and intercept the water entering them. Um, they could be gypsum curtains, um, a byproduct from coal production, slag filters, a byproduct from steel production that can absorb phosphorus, or they can be ditch wall biofilters, which are made with um, wood chips. This is actually a picture here of the in-ditch biofilter. Um, and basically, these wood chips provide an energy source for the microorganisms that convert um, nitrate and nitrogen from fertilizers into atmospheric nitrogen and just completely remove it from the system. Moving to some of the mitigating the impacts as far as subsurface drainage, water table management um, is one of the bigger efforts. And basically, like we just, just discussed with the digits, it's having the ability to actually control the water table in the field rather than just lowering it to the level of the tile drain um, at times when there's less precipitation or if a crop um, is dormant, you can um, increase the water table in the field. And that saturation drives that denitrification process that removes the nitrogen. This is uh, mentioned in Conservation Practice Standard 554. Um, and the big benefit of this is more efficient use of rainfall and decreased need for irrigation if the system is actively managed. So there is some data suggesting that controlled drainage can actually um, provide crop yield benefits. But again, that depends on the level of management of the system. So this figure just illustrates the difference between subsurface drainage, where all the water is entering the tile drain, controlled drainage, where we can send water um, actually to increase the level of the water table, and then sub-irrigation, which is a more complex system and designed differently than just a dry drainage system, where you pump water into um, 
actually raise the water table when needed in irrigating the crops. So another best management practice for subsurface drainage is to retain water, um, like we said, retain water during the not growing season. Um, these drainage control structures, we mentioned that it increases the res residence time. Um, and since the level setting is flexible, um, it can give um, more confidence in adjusting the level as needed, whereas tile plug can be riskier and impact your drainage. This is a uh, schematic of the biofilter system, and these are just simple wood chip systems that are allowed to become saturated and increase uh, nitrogen removal. And the added benefit of these systems is that they implement the, um, the control structures used in drainage water management. So you get the opportunity to increase your residence time with your water during the non-growing season. And then in the growing season, you can still use your drainage system that, um, as, as a passive system, but actually filter some of the nutrients out of that water as it leaves the field. So this is a picture of a controlled drainage retrofit that we actually did at the Virginia Tech Agricultural Research and Extension Center on the Eastern Shore. Um, we have a couple of biofilter systems here. We have the plastic wood chip biofilter, the tile runs this way, this is the inlet structure. And then we have a biofilter with the addition of biochar, which we're exploring um, as a, a media to remove actually the phosphorus in addition to the nitrogen. You can also look at riparian wetlands to um, intercept the tile drainage waters before it enters um, a collection canal or a stream. And these have the added benefit of not only nutrient removal, but providing habitat. There are also subsurface uh, constructed wetland designs, which are pretty similar to the, the biofilter, except they are more of an ecosystems engineering approach, including vegetation. So I'd like to thank you all for inviting me here to speak today. Um, you may contact either myself or uh, Dr. Zekistin if you have um, any follow-up and 